This week on Outdoor Oklahoma. Paddlefish are one of our state's most unique fish species. We'll look at the Wildlife Department's research partners and discover what's being done to restore and enhance paddlefish populations in their natural range. Right now on Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. You know, of all the incredible fish species that we have here in Oklahoma, I think I find the paddlefish to be the most intriguing. They're certainly one of the oldest known species to exist in this part of the world. In the fossil record, they date back as far as 125 million years to the Cretaceous period. And their skeletons are mostly made up of cartilage, just like your ear and your nose. And although they're not related, sometimes they're called the freshwater shark because they both have cartilage skeletons and because of the shape of their tail fins. But what truly sets paddlefish apart from other fish species is their iconic rostrum or snout. It's covered with literally tens of thousands of sensory receptors used to help locate their main food source, microscopic zooplankton. In Oklahoma, we're blessed with an abundance of paddlefish. We even have a state-of-the-art research center and biologists whose entire focus is dedicated to this one species. Even so, sometimes we have the opportunity to collaborate with state and federal agencies. Today, we're going to highlight one such project that brought our biologists together with researchers from Oklahoma State University and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Tishomingo National Fish Hatchery. So we're out here today in the Spring River trying to catch adult paddlefish to serve as broodstock for Tishomingo National Fish Hatchery. And the purpose of this is for a long-term restoration project for paddlefish in John Redmond Reservoir on the Neosho River in Kansas. We collaborated with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and Tishomingo uh, National Fish Hatchery as well as the Oklahoma Field Wildlife Conservation Office which is also with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. The stock that we're sampling right now is the same stock as would be in the Neosho River in Kansas. So we're basically collecting adults to make baby paddlefish to stock back into the same system up in Kansas because the creation of that reservoir prevented paddlefish from remaining in the system upstream. We partnered up with uh, the ODWC to help them with uh, evaluating restoration success of paddlefish in reservoirs. And uh, of course what we do at uh, the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit and at OSU is uh, we help provide um, research personnel to answer uh, targeted questions. We focused our restoration efforts in Oklahoma in four reservoirs, Lake Texoma, Caw Lake, Uluga Lake and Eufaula Lake. Uh, we don't feel that we had any success in Texoma Lake. Eufaula Lake is just ending a 10 year uh, restoration stocking period, so we haven't fully evaluated that reservoir yet. However, Uluga Lake and Call Lake appear to be restoration successes, particularly Uluga Lake, which we began stocking in the late 90s. Uh, we went back several years ago 
to do our, our regular monitoring of different reservoirs in Oklahoma, and the catch rate for adult paddlefish was immense. Uh, we observed numerous year classes, numerous size classes, and all indications pointed to the fact that we had natural recruitment in Uligal Lake on the Vertigus River system. So we weren't catching fish that were just stocked. We were catching the, the, the progeny of those stocked fish, possibly multiple generations of, of naturally recruited fish. Uh, restoring paddlefish to Uligal Lake has resulted in you know, a massive increase in the Uligal Lake paddlefish snag fishing opportunities, which is uh, good for Oklahoma anglers also good for the species. So the question that we're trying to answer, we have uh, two specific uh, questions related to the probability of success of stocking paddlefish in reservoirs. One of those is how much spawning habitat in the rivers above the reservoirs is available to those paddlefish. Um, is there the right type of substrate and is there inadequate enough of that substrate? And so um, we're doing a lot of surveys, we'll be starting this year and next, where we use uh, side scan sonar technology to basically paint a picture of the bottom. And from that, we can classify and um, quantify how much spawning substrate's available. And then the, uh, the second question that, uh, that we're working on, we have another colleague in the integrative biology department and uh, we're looking at how much zooplankton is available to paddlefish. Uh, so paddlefish is a, um, what they call a ram filter feeder, uh, and they eat the smallest uh, things out there in the water, and that's zooplankton. Uh, swim around with their mouth open and uh, strain plankton from the water. So when uh, paddlefish are born and start to growing up, they obviously need something to eat on. And so one of the other hypotheses that we're investigating is how much food is available to juvenile paddlefish so that they can grow and become adult paddlefish later. The core of our management is research which informs the way we craft regulations. Uh, we don't just make regulations just because we have gut feelings. We develop research projects uh, to answer ecological questions to guide our decisions on regulation. For the spawning substrate question, uh, we're actually using some GIS technology with some um, substrate maps and it's pointing us to some areas where there might be a lot of um, the right kind of substrate. Uh, paddlefish spawn on a fairly hard substrate, gravel, uh, boulder, what we call cobble. Uh, their eggs are sticky, they adhere to those things. So um, that points us in an area where we can look. Uh, then the sonar is a fine resolution that allows us to literally see pieces of substrate. So we can pick out uh, gravel and even uh, sizes of rock. So that should allow us then to quantify how much that is. The key question we have is why was Uliga a success and why are we seeing indications of success in Kaw, whereas we didn't see that in Texoma, and we're not sure yet about Uluga, or about Eufaula Lake. And so we've come up with some, a lot of research questions that we want to try to answer, and we've, we've affiliated with some researchers at Oklahoma State University to hopefully look at some of those questions and come up with some data to indicate what factors influence restoration success in these reservoirs. And can we use that information to potentially expand restoration efforts in Oklahoma for reservoirs that are within the historical range of paddlefish, but don't currently contain paddlefish within their, their fisheries community? At OSU, we rely a lot on graduate students. Uh, one, of the, one of the missions of the university is, uh, is educating the next generation of resource professionals. And, one of that training is they do a graduate project. Uh, so um, the sonar project that we have going and the, uh, the zooplankton abundance, we both have uh, students on there that are pursuing their master's degrees. Uh, they'll develop a, their own research plan that has to be defended in front of a committee and then they will write a thesis. Uh, and that thesis then um, 
turns into a report that we uh, send to the wildlife department and uh, so that they can evaluate um, you know what we've agreed to help them with. Basically it's a little bit of a luxurious boat ride so I've got my side scan unit with a transducer on the bow of the boat and I've got my GPS and it's a recreational grade sonar so you'll find it on a lot of um, nicer bass boats that um, people use for bass fishing tournaments. Um, and basically I have three different transects and um, I'll start wherever I want to start recording data. We have 100 kilometer sections on each of the rivers we're looking at and we've broken those up into five 10 kilometer sections. And uh, we'll start at the beginning and I just hit a button on my, GP on my uh, GPS, my Humminbird GPS. It starts recording and I just drive up 10 kilometers, turn around, I drive back down 10 kilometers and then I go to the left side of the river and drive up 10 kilometers and I do that five times on each river. So it's pretty much a luxurious boat ride a little bit. Um, I mean, it can get a little bit intense with high flows and things like that and you have to keep an eye out, but for the most part, it's pretty, uh, it's not very labor intensive until I get to the post processing where for, I, I guess for about every hour I spend on the boat, I'll probably end up spending about three hours looking at substrate uh, on the computer and identifying it and, and sorting them out. As uh, paddlefish uh, hatch from their eggs, uh, they, um, they float up, they live off their yolk sac for a while, for a, you know, a few days, but then they transition to feeding. Uh, paddlefish larvae are really interesting in that um, they don't have the characteristic snout until they grow larger. So when they're babies, they look like a tiny little shark. And if you look at them under a microscope, they'll even have tiny little shark teeth. Uh, and at that stage, they're, they are actively hunting individual zooplankton. So they uh, are after a certain type. So certain types matter um, at the right time of year. Uh, as the paddlefish uh, grow and become larger, their, uh, their rostrum develops and they start to uh, actively seek um, schools of plankton. And they actually have uh, electroreceptors on their uh, rostrum that help them locate. Just like a shark has electroreceptors, they have the same thing to help them locate schools of plankton. Um, so since paddlefish are born in the rivers and then they move down the river into the reservoir, they need to have an adequate source of zooplankton along the whole way. And zooplankton dynamics change a lot from reservoir to river. Uh, and, and so that's one aspect that we're particularly interested in is um, what are these systems like from river to reservoir in terms of uh, the food resource for, uh, for paddlefish, particularly juvenile paddlefish. Yeah, as a state manager of, of a fish species that is popular for angling, I have a great responsibility to try to enhance angling opportunities, preserve the opportunities that currently exist, and uh, do, do as much research and monitoring and management as I can to make sure that this resource is just sustainable for the future. And angling is part of that. Um, so these restoration projects, it's not only to restore the species to its native range, native habitats, but it's also to provide opportunities for anglers to create fisheries. Um, so it's kind of a win-win. If, if we succeed at restoration, then we're succeeding at creating a fishery most of the time as well. We want to get these fish back as quickly as possible, but at the same time we're taking precautions to make sure that we're lowering the stress on them. So we go out during the coldest months of the year to collect the brood stock because the lower the water temperature, the more oxygen is in the water, so the better they're off they're going to be. Plus, we also add salt to the water, which replenishes the electrolytes that they may lose from stress. We have oxygen on board, we have that water bubbling, so we're making sure that we're lowering the stress as much as possible on these fish, and we do. We get them back as quickly as possible, and we put them into ponds to recover before we spawn them. Now what we're going to do is we collected six female and six male. We're gonna take them back to the hatchery. We'll actually place them into ponds until the temperatures warm up enough, until they're ready to spawn. Then we'll bring them in, we'll actually put them in tanks where we can monitor them more regularly. We'll prepare them for spawning. We'll collect the milts from the males, which is just the fish sperm. 
Uh, then we will go ahead and collect the eggs from the females. We'll mix those together and we actually have to add water to the milt in order to activate that. So then that milt will fertilize the eggs. We'll put them in jars. We'll let them roll with water and oxygen. In about five days, they'll hatch out and we'll put those young fry into tanks. In about two weeks, they'll be able to externally feed and we will actually pellet train them. So while they're planktivores, while they're eating zooplankton, uh, which is in our water source, it comes from a natural water source, we will also pellet train them so we can make sure that we get them nice and healthy and hearty before we stock them out. Collecting the fish that will be used as the brood stock is only the first part of this process. Now we're going to fast forward a few weeks and catch up with the team at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Tishomingo National Fish Hatchery. Fish are corralled or pushed to the end of the raceway so that they'll be easier to grab by hand. As each fish is brought out, its jaw tag is recorded and the females are injected with a hormone that induces their body to release eggs as it would during a natural spawn. Then they are carefully put into a transfer tank. The females are then placed into another tank in the lab and checked periodically for the effectiveness of the hormone. Biologists can tell under a microscope when the eggs are staging to be released. At the same time, organic material is added to water in a hatching jar. During a natural spawn, the eggs will have an adhesive nature that helps them stick to rocks. This organic material helps to counteract the adhesiveness of the eggs so they won't stick to themselves. An aerator helps to keep everything stirred and moving. Once the female is ready, it's transferred to a small tank that has anesthesia in it to numb its body before surgery. Once we get her put under and him started over there, then we'll get the other one and work in on the other side. When the anesthesia takes effect, 
the female is moved to a table where biologists can begin the process of removing the eggs. A careful incision is made on the belly of the fish. Eggs are just beneath the skin and are scooped out with a special spoon. Once the biologists feel they have removed the majority of the eggs, the incision is stitched back up and the fish is monitored a while before returning it back to a holding pond on the hatchery. added the milk to them, the paddlefish milk, and now this is 10 minutes of the fertilization process to make sure that all, all the fertilizer that the sperm gets to each and every egg as best as possible. The male milt or sperm is added to the eggs and gently stirred for 10 minutes. The fertilized eggs are then transferred to a hatching jar equipped with an aerator and continuously flushed with clean water. In about five days, baby paddlefish will hatch and are grown out in hatchery pond before they're released. While we may have populations here in Oklahoma, we're not, you know, not all of them are self-sustaining. So a lot of the reason that we do have a lot of paddlefish here in Oklahoma really does have to do with the hatcheries going out and augmenting those populations. And now we're really excited because we're seeing those self-sustaining populations that are occurring because of those reintroductions and augmentations to the systems. Paddlefish are a key focus for management, restoration, and research in Oklahoma. And the Department of Wildlife is, is just one member of that team. And it's really important that we continue collaborating with federal agencies and universities to manage this species effectively. 
It's exciting to know that much of the most significant cutting edge research on paddlefish happens right here in Oklahoma. And thanks to the efforts of the Wildlife Department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Oklahoma State University, we're having a real and positive impact on this incredible fish species. If you've never experienced the thrill of catching a paddlefish yourself, well, take it from me. It's quite a workout, but it's totally worth it. Hey, thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Thank you.